So now I have the pleasure of introducing Carol Stevens, Executive Director for Media Relations and Strategic Communications at the American Bar Association. Before joining the ABA, Carol spent more than 30 years as a journalist, including seven years as managing editor for news at USA Today. And she also served as a reporter for Detroit News, Washington Bureau, and Washingtonian Magazine. So we're very honored that she could be with us today. I'd most like to welcome her and the panelists she will introduce to the stage. Thank you all. Good afternoon. In my career, I've, I've done a lot of interviews, and I can't think of a more inspiring assignment than the one I have today. To talk with these three accomplished women about the role women play in defending human rights and democracy. Each member of this group is a leader, and each is committed to advancing and defending human rights. Because we want to hear from them, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my introduction, but I invite each of you to review their bios in your printed program. I think uh, you will find them instructive and inspiring. Our first honored guest today is Chief Justice Maasa Kanafi, the first female president of the Federal Supreme Court of Ethiopia. The Chief Justice. <laughs> the Chief Justice with fellow women lawyers reformed the Ethiopian justice system's treatment of sexual harassment cases. How is that for a legacy? Welcome to Justice. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Judge Susan G. Braden. Judge Braden recently retired from the United States Court of Federal Claims, where she has served as Chief Judge since 2017. The U.S. Court of Federal Claims has exclusive jurisdiction over cases against the federal government arising from issues such as breach of contract, patent or copyright infringement, and federal tax refund disputes. We look forward to hearing Judge Braden's insights on the U.S. judiciary. Welcome. I'm also happy to introduce Dean Rosa Solario. Dean Solario is a giant in the field of human rights and human rights in the Americas. She is the Associate Dean for International and Comparative Legal Studies at George Washington Law School, and she is also the Burnett Family Professorial Lecturer in International and Comparative Law and Policy, where she focuses on legal education and the impact of defending um, human rights. Please welcome Dean Solario. We're going to hear, have the chance to hear from each of these women, and I'm going to start with a few questions for the Chief Justice. You have a fascinating personal narrative. Can you talk to us about critical events in your life that inspired you to join the judiciary? Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And uh, I would also like to thank you for opportunity to answer this question for providing my brief and for uh, the opportunity to participate in this uh, great panel. Um, in terms of uh, uh, my uh, role in the judiciary, uh, in at some point in my career, I have served as a type of uh, judge, but then um, I uh, left the judiciary and uh, I was engaged in um, other professional uh, uh, careers. Uh, last year, I was um, appointed as the uh, president of the Supreme Court in Manhattan, and uh, my appointment is related to uh, the democratic school transition that's uh, ongoing uh, in our country uh, right now. Uh, when the proposal came, I, it was not an instant yes, because um, I had a very comfortable job at the United Nations, and um, I also had family responsibility. And uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, I thought about it, and um, I, uh, you know, took the opportunity because I thought this is a lifetime opportunity, and uh, being appointed as the first uh, female chief justice is uh, a very important uh, 
uh, honor, honorable uh, thing to do. So I decided to take the position. So the judiciary that uh, uh, I inherited uh, uh, is uh, very uh, uh, weak uh, in its system. Um, it was a very limited uh, resource, financial resource, human uh, resource, uh, very uh, limited uh, public trust. But um, I have launched a big reform program, a big reform agenda, and uh, also with the help of uh, development partners uh, such as USAID, uh, we are embarking on a big uh, reform agenda, and uh, I, am, I am, I think, and I'm very positive about it. Thank you. Can you tell us some about the uh, role of women, um, women in promoting justice and human rights in Ethiopia? Sure. Um, before uh, my work with the United Nations, I was, uh, uh, I was an activist. I was a women's rights uh, leader, and uh, that's why I really like uh, civil society organizations. I like uh, non-profit organizations, and uh, I, um, I'm, I think I think the world in this room uh, because uh, many of you are uh, working with the community, and I have been there. I, I, I like you, so <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was the director of the Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association for eight years, and a group of women established that organization. And we have done uh, very important advocacy work. We have uh, uh, managed to. Uh, lobby for the uh, reform of discriminatory laws in Ethiopia. We have represented thousands of women who uh, do not afford uh, formal uh, professional services, legal services. We have established uh, paralegals, uh, not only in the capital city, but across uh, the country. And in a nutshell, we uh, put front and center uh, women's rights issues and, and gender equality issues. So, yes. Um, yeah, no, it's not only in Ethiopia, but uh, in Africa in general, women's rights organizations, especially women lawyers organizations, are very active in pushing justice and uh, human rights agenda, particularly related to uh, gender justice. Ms. Brady, can you tell us uh, about the critical events in your professional and personal experience that set the stage for you joining the judiciary? Thank you, Carol. Um, as a matter of personal privilege, since I used to be the chief, I wanted to, um, if Ambassador Wafi is out there from the year, he's my neighbor <laughs> across the street. And I'm, I have learned so much about the, they have made a major impact on the fight against terror and have been a tremendous ally as other countries have been in the Africa. Um, I also want to you recognize John Jacob from the State Department who's here. John is the person that is responsible for bringing judges from other nations to ours and for having our judges go to other nations. And he's, this has been a labor of love for him, and I hope you have a chance to say hi to me at the table. <laughs> and he's sitting next to my husband who's most handsome man in the world. Right. <laughs> and in charge of international matters for the American Bar Association, for that matter. Now, your question was why to become a judge? Well, what in your background led you to become a judge? I love being a trial lawyer. I love it, and I love my judges. I always consider the judge most important thing, more than the client, because you have to convey to the judge right away uh, one thing, which is you have the white hat on, and that has to happen early in the case. And um, the judges are so used to hearing, you know, blah, 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 blah. The point is to say, look, there are two people in this room, and one of them is not a good person. <laughs> and it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see as the biggest challenge facing women in the judiciary? I don't know the answer to that, really. I mean, I, I did want to say, I, I wrote something down because you were supposed to ask me this question. But um, <laughs> she was supposed to ask me about being a woman judge. And um, as Carol and other people know, John knows that we were very fortunate. My husband and I went with the, for the justices of the Supreme Court to their first formal visit to Europe at the end of the 90s. Justice O'Connor led that delegation. And she alone, probably of all the justices in the last 50 years, has, has been the most involved 
with understanding the importance of creating personal relationships internationally with all judges, particularly women judges. Now, I'll never forget when we went to Germany, and she, you would have thought that she was, you know, a rock star. They all knew her personally. She had correspondence with them. She had taken the time enough to do that. When she went on the bench, she was asked about what was the importance of her being on the Supreme Court. And she said, the importance of my appointment is not that I will decide cases as a woman, but that I will be a woman deciding cases. And are there challenges for women? There are challenges for men. There are challenges for everybody. You know, I, I mean, I just think that my own view is we need to get beyond the gender issue and, and go to what's really important, which is providing justice. Dean Solario, what in your personal history and background inspired you to do the important work you do today? That's a wonderful question. And first of all, I just want to say um, what an honor it is to be here and also to be seated with these wonderful women who have accomplished so much, because this is precisely what we're working for, to see women in leadership positions. In my particular case, um, I had a sense of what was unjust very early on in my life. I actually grew up in Puerto Rico. I saw a lot of things when I was growing up. And one thing that really shaped me is my parents once took me to a battered women's shelter. And I started working there as a volunteer. And I have to say, that was probably one of the most important formative experiences I had when I was growing up. Um, I was able to interact with a lot of women that had suffered so many human rights violations that they were in very dire circumstances. And after that, that really led me to a lot of gender work in my career. And also, I'm the daughter of a Cuban immigrant. And I think that shaped me. That shaped me, that made me interested in international affairs. It made me interested in social issues. But I always tell my students that, in my particular case, I kind of discovered a passion. And I think that's very important in life. Um, I, I started working on international law, basically, right after law school. Um, I encountered human rights and completely fell in love with it and felt that it was the right thing to do. Um, and I've been very fortunate to be able to um, have a career where I've always been connected to it um, and to the world in many ways. And I think that's so important. I echo everything that the panelists have already said about the importance of this kind of program, the importance of us having more for us to be able to have discussions with this kind of institution. Thank you. Now, turning now to your role, turning now to your role as a dean, as the number of women in higher education has increased, how has that affected um, uh, universities, and also has it affected their ability to address issues like human rights? Thank you. I actually think that's a wonderful question. Every day we have more women in higher education. Um, at our law school, it's actually the majority of students are women, which is absolutely wonderful, and I think it has added a layer of diversity, a participatory approach, an inclusive approach to the discussions. We notice it in classrooms, and I think also we are training lawyers that represent more what our society looks like. I mean, the, the legal profession has to reflect the culture, the viewpoints, the differences, and I think women bring that to the table. One thing, though, that we're working for to do in a very... Um, I think in a very persistent way that's very needed is that I do see a lot of women graduating from law school, which is wonderful, and I love being a part of that, but I do want to see them also in leadership positions and in decision-making positions, and I want them to have a voice and to be able to actually set the pace and, and to have more influence in society in general. And I think that's where women, we still have a lot of work to do, and society as a whole has work to do on this. Um, and I think also, socially, we have a responsibility to build societies where we have better conditions also for women to succeed, that they have access to the education they need, that they access the contact, the networking, the resources, um, and also the different kinds of support, you know, that you need to be able to have a successful career and also be able to balance a lot of other things in your life. And I think we have, we're very, um, 
long and far away from that. We're still working on building societies that are more favorable for women to attain leadership positions. And, and my personal view. Chief Justice, uh, you're an alumnus of the International Visitor Leadership Program. So what about this program and your travels from Washington, D.C. to Portland, Oregon, Cincinnati, Boston, Detroit? What in this program uh, prepared you to be on the path you're on today? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, that question. Uh, my visit as the, as the international law uh, the leadership visitor uh, uh, was very interesting, but um, it happened many years ago. Uh, it happened in uh, 1997. Uh, I remember it was uh, uh, 19 uh, young African leaders, and six of them were women. And uh, as you said, uh, we have visited uh, for this uh, important uh, city. So um, I I don't remember every detail, but uh, what I remember is that uh, I uh, took a lot of uh, lessons, uh, especially in terms of uh, institution building, how institution building is taken very seriously in America, um, how organizations are run, because uh, we have visited the universities, the non-profit organizations, and the private sector, uh, and so on. Uh, I was also uh, struck by uh, the hospitality and the uh, you know, kindness of uh, people because uh, we, do, we go uh, to um, private homes for uh, dinner and for lunch. And uh, people always uh, went out of their way to accommodate them uh, and uh, assist us. So uh, I have a very positive uh, memory about that. Uh, I'm not in touch with uh, all the 19 Africans who participated in this event, but uh, I'm sure they're doing something very important in their uh, community. But at least I know that the uh, uh, Minister of uh, Justice uh, for Rwanda uh, was uh, one of uh, the participants uh, in this uh, program. Um, uh, you know, you touched upon this on several factors, but uh, especially earlier on, earlier in your career, uh, having exposure to this kind of uh, very systematic uh, you know, learning uh, is quite useful, and uh, I think uh, it has put the community greatly at the risk. Ms. Brayden, your bio shows that you have legal expertise in many technical fields that until recently weren't really associated with attracting a lot of women. How have you ensured your voice has been heard? In the technical world, um, I got involved with um, how what is copyright law shapes a lot of computer software and changed the law in the country, the country and in the EU uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s when the law decision was made. Um, and from that, I became involved in a lot of other areas. In technology. I'm actually now on the board of two private companies that are involved in artificial intelligence, which is a, obviously a very important and growing area of technology. Um, it's interesting you should ask this because yesterday I just had, um, wrote a letter to nominate a friend of mine from the intellectual property section of the American Bar Association to, for the um, is it Brent? Margaret Brent Award. And I said, I noticed for all the, the number of people who have been in that, they've never nominated or appointed someone from that field. This woman has a, was an a, a electrical engineer and a computer engineer before she learned the law. I'm very active in another group called CHIPS. Um, CHIPS in intellectual property law. <laughs> and that group was formed 10 years ago. We now have 30,000 lawyers, women lawyers and lawmakers around the world who are involved in technology. Now, we all know that's where the jobs are, where the opportunity is, where the money is. So, you know, my view is uh, that's one of the most important areas for women to be involved with the law because, you know, you go where the money is, right? Uh, and 
that was just what she was doing. I'd be crying in the middle of all the Lord's country. Small countries such as yours have such a wonderful opportunity to um, begin to grow young lawyers in this field. And uh, I think human rights is important, but the technology that's going to enable people to understand and see where there are violations of the law. So that people understand things, you get an international consensus about here's a problem, we now need to look through that, and how do they learn that? Through technology, right? So, um, that's where it is. And I was going to say that I'm proud to announce that the president um, appointed me to the full board board for the holiday. So if you have any friends who want to be a Fulbright scholar from any of the countries or whatever, and particularly for intellectual property, please get their applications in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dean, what specific role do law schools have in promoting human rights? I think it's a very important role. Um, we're planning the future. I mean, in many ways, we're planning the present, too. I've never seen so much student mobilization as I've seen in the past eight years, especially in our law school. Um, and I think we also have a responsibility in terms of the values that students carry with them after they graduate from law school. We teach a lot of theory, of course. We teach a lot of practice. Uh, we make sure that they're exposed to conflict. We make sure that they're exposed to networks. But I think those values for us that key. So, for example, I always tell my students, it doesn't matter where you're working. It doesn't matter um, if you're a law firm partner, or if you're a judge, or if you're in a nonprofit, or if you're in the federal government. At the end of the day, you can take values like diversity, and gender equality, and human rights, and rule of law, and access to justice, um, and a worldview that accommodates for different thinking, and colorism, and pluralism. You can take that everywhere. You don't necessarily need to be in the public sector, who have to do that. And I think probably that's where our most important role is. Because the reality is that we are going to give them a lot of knowledge in law school, but at the end of the day, they do have to be in practice to learn how to do their craft in many ways. So those values. And I think another thing that's important when you, um, when you are in an education role is that a lot of our students are very young. Um, they're developing their sense of the law, the world, you know, the social contributions that they can make. So I see it as an opportunity to work with them, maybe a few years, maybe one year, um, to help them in that development. Because at the end of the day, many of them are going to be leaders like you. Many of them are going to be in influential positions. And for me, it's very important to see more leaders with those values that I mentioned. So I think for us, that's probably the most important part of the education. How do uh, female lawyers and female law professors um, fit in this equation? I actually think that the legal profession is one of those professions where you're seeing some gradual change, where you are seeing more women professors, which is absolutely fantastic, where you're seeing more women deans. Right now, about 10 law schools this year appointed new deans, and most of them were actually women which is fantastic, it's refreshing. But I think we have a long way to go. And the reality is that um, I think for a lot of women to reach career goals as high as being a distinguished law professor in the United States, or being a dean, or, or having any sort of like academic leadership position, you also have to encourage them when they're young. I think a lot of women don't necessarily grow up thinking, I'm going to be the dean of a law school when I grow up. <laughs> you know, you basically have to encourage girls to dream and to dream high and to dream in terms of also diversity. What kind of sectors can I work in? What kind of education do I need? What kind of, how do I build an academic profile or a professional profile to be able to later be able to fit to be a dean of a law school? Our law school is actually going through a dean selection process. Uh, and it has been fascinating for all of us to watch because there's been a very heavy encouragement for women to come and interview us. But we're always saying, especially the woman dean, um, 
you have to help women get from point A to point B. If you want a woman to have the extraordinary credentials to be the dean of a law school, you have to work with them since they're young. I was lucky. I had so many mentors. I was surrounded by people that were advising me, um, that helped guide me to my career. And I'm so grateful for them today. And I think that's so important for women in general. And I also grew up um, in a place and with a family that encouraged me to dream very high. And I'm still like that. I still dream very large. And, and I think that's absolutely fantastic. The moment that you stop dreaming, we don't have any hope anymore. But I do think... But that has to start since young. And, and I think with us, I try, at least in the age that the attorneys come in, the future attorneys, to try to give them that. Give them that hope, give them that energy, and hopefully that carries them through their careers. And, and I hope to see more women leaders in the future. You know, I think there's a lot happening around us that's very interesting, but we do have a lot of work in terms of creating those conditions in my view. Justice, what are some of the opportunities and some of the challenges for women who are in leadership positions? Um, for women in uh, leadership positions, uh, there are many opportunities um, because uh, they can move to positions, uh, they can contribute to development, and they can contribute to well esteem. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I was uh, reading a piece uh, that um, talked about um, Angela Merkel's uh, proposal to organize uh, a Europe-Africa conference. And uh, the title of that conference is, Let's Listen to One Another. She did not say, listen to me. She said, let's listen to one another. So uh, there are, you know, global leaders who can make a big impact, uh, but women at every level, uh, whether uh, maybe in the private sector or public sector or the community mobilization, they have a very important role and they can make decisions and they can, they can make a difference. The challenge is, um, of course, uh, the stereotype. Uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, Members of our society, because of socialization, we believe that you know women are not you know competent enough. Uh, our prime minister was uh, recently talking informally about um, the appointment of uh, women in Ethiopia. Uh, the government appointed 50 percent of the cabinet women on uh, 50 percent of the cabinet. Uh, president of the country is now a woman. President of Supreme Court, and I said, I am, I am here. So he said sometimes people walk to him and they say, are you sure these women are going to really be efficient and effective? And he said, nobody asked me about me. You know, there are many lousy men out there <laughs> who do not deserve that. So that kind of, that mental, you know, straight up is still there. But as long as you're smart, as long as you're organized, as long as you're a team builder, you know, they will accept it sooner or later. But the other uh, also kind of tricky uh, situation, uh, at least for me, is, um, you know, my previous role in my first role. Uh, I was an activist. I was on the other side of the fence. Now I'm heading the judiciary. So sometimes when something terrible happens on women, uh, they, you know, criticize me on social media to say, why is she not speaking? Why is she not, you know, taking position on this uh, uh, particular case? But, you know, it takes a little bit of communication, and I hope uh, we're not in that big crisis, but, you know, I think the transition that we need uh, to make, we have to make sure uh, wherever we are to empower women, but at the same time, uh, we need to communicate with society to uh, help them understand our broader mind. Judge Brady, you invited us to get beyond gender. So will you give us leadership advice both for the men and women in this room? Leadership advice, I mean, you've got to, any Fortune 500 company 
CEO, and I will tell you they have failed in the past. And they have failed more than once in the past. You can't lead unless you learn to take a risk. Okay? You need a number of different things. You've got to suck it up and take that risk and, and be prepared that you may fail. But you want to give it your all. And then if you fail, then you go back, retrench, and do it again. And, and there's probably no one in the room that has not failed at something, whether they're men or women, in your profession. It's just the way life is. No one talks about it very much. But being a risk taker, uh, being, um, having the self-esteem to take responsibility for that and your own actions and to do so with good intentions, not just, you know, for bad reasons, but basically you really think this is the way to go about something. And some of you may not like that. And guess what? They may be right. You may be right. But if you, if you sit still in your box, you're never going to get anything done. That's a nice, safe, cozy place. Okay? So, take a risk. Do something. Say something. Do something. Jean, you talk to us about making sure our voices are heard um, as women, as human rights advocates. How do we do that? We have to speak. And I know it sounds really basic, but the reality is that women are not encouraged to agree to voice what they think. And sometimes they're not encouraged to be who they are. And the reality is that if, if we have learned something from the Me Too movement, from the Time Shop movement, from everything that has happened, you know, in many countries um, in the past 20 years, is that the reality is that we should be at the table as well. We should be shaping policy, shaping legislation, shaping programs, being elected judges, really, at the end of the day, moving many wheels in society. And the reality is that women are not necessarily taught to do that. You would be shocked at the amount of law students, and I work with law students, that usually lawyers, we love speaking. <laughs> it's part of who we are, right? The amount of women law students that have had conversations with them, and they're like, I think I sound too aggressive. I think I sound too assertive. Maybe I should try to be a little bit more um, restrained. And the reality is that we, we were all brought up that way. But at the end of the day, I think real leadership is about speaking up and voicing what you think and being creative and pushing that boundary and being groundbreaking and dealing with the challenges. And you don't necessarily do that staying quiet. Um, but this is, especially in the human rights field, we call this a stereotype, you know, the stereotype notion of how women leaders should be, right? But at the end of the day, I think it's time to break that stereotype. We need women to speak up. And why not? And the reality also that I think is complicated also is that women are subjected to a double standard. The reality is that women are judged in a much more stricter way socially, and this applies to leadership positions as well. And I think we need to really identify those stereotypes, um, eradicate those stereotypes. I think that's all very important for women to be able to sit at the table. And I think women are not only the ones that have to speak up, but I also think that we have to build social conditions, and this also includes men, to be able to give women spaces to be able to do this as well. Um, I think this is a social responsibility that we all have, um, but it's something that we really need to do, in my, in my view. I think it's a priority. I know there are some members of the audience that may have a few questions. So while uh, there's microphones on each side of the room, and while you're going to those microphones, I have one question for each of you. It's the same question. As we seek to empower human rights advocates, um, leaders, and women, what advice would you give today to your 20-year-old self? I'll start with you, Chief Justice. Um, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think in my case, um, 
I believe I have done okay because uh, uh, until I was the age of uh, 17, I didn't have access to television set. Uh, I traveled to the capital city to join a uh, law school uh, from far away. I, uh, I grew up in a very small community. You can call it a you know, remote community, 800 kilometers outside the center. So, um, but uh, I believe uh, I made use of uh, every opportunity that came across uh, my way. So I don't know if uh, I would do uh, anything differently because, um, you know, my, uh, my bio, my experience has been summarized in, in one paragraph over there, <laughs> but uh, it's like uh, 15 years investment and I have uh, really worked very hard. So I don't want to be, uh, you know, hard on myself. I think uh, I want to congratulate, congratulate myself. But having said, yeah, having said that, um, I still have a, uh, you know, uh, message and advice to my 20 years old daughter and uh, other parents as well. And some of which um, uh, have been already mentioned and, uh, you know, they need to focus more on what they're doing and uh, they have to focus on the, on the price. Uh, mentorship is very important. It could be, you know, their mothers, their aunties, their teachers, their supervisors. But I think I benefited a lot from my mentor Um And also, uh, I think it's important on who they associate with, who you associate with. You know, your friendship, your partners, very important because you need to be around people who nurture you. And uh, you need to be able to do well, and um, they have to be assertive. They don't need to be aggressive, but they have to be assertive. They have to know their rights, and they have to stand up for their rights. And uh, Judge Susan was talking about this. We were talking about, uh, talking about these cases. That's also very important because, uh, you know, challenge comes along our way. Uh, you know, we don't have time, but I could have talked about a lot of challenges that I faced both as a community leader, and when I was uh, establishing a bank, a full-fledged bank, focusing on women, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of challenge. But yesterday also somebody said, never give up. So I do think that advice to me. Yeah. Thank you. Ed what advice would you give your 20-year-old son? Don't worry so much. <laughs> <laughs> The second thing is, you know, it's okay that you don't know everything or are so sophisticated or whatever. I got into the job of being a lawyer by mistake. I, I, long story short, I worked um, in Atlanta Legal Aid Society the summer before I went to decide to go law school. And I got the job because I wrote a letter to the director because they were bringing cases in the Supreme Court and I thought it'd be fun to go involved in this. Of course, I wasn't a lawyer. I didn't realize he wrote me a rejection letter. He wrote me a letter saying, Dear Miss Reagan, what a fine resume you have to represent a man, so please do it. So, and I thought it meant yes. <laughs> so I kept busy the days before internet. I wrote letters back saying, I'm coming on this day. I didn't have a phrase I said, they're so busy. I was at Atlanta Airport and I called him and I said, I'm here. And he said, well, come on down. <laughs> that was my first job. I didn't know any better. <laughs> Wait a minute, it gets worse. So the first job, the first thing I actually did work on was a case that went to the Supreme Court of the United States. I didn't do any brief writing that, but it I came to Washington to watch the argument. Based on that, I thought, I can do this. I've done Supreme Court work. I'm going to law school. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but sometimes it's just as well. You know, take a risk. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. I see our time is finishing up, and do you, I don't know if you're waiting for audience questions, but I want to say something to the Chief Justice before you end the program. Okay, Dean Solari, what's your advice to yourself? And we only have a minute and a half, so I'm uh, afraid we're going to have to. A minute and a half. <laughs> yeah. I will tell you what I tell my students. I do advise a lot of 20-something-year-olds as part of being a dean. I think being creative is that important. Never lose that. Be persistent. There's 
a lot in life that can be challenging, especially in careers and especially in that road to leadership. It's important to be persistent, but it's important also to be prepared. Education is key. Nobody can take that away from you. And I always tell that to my students, but I think dreaming big is very, very important as well. Have goals. Have dreams. Never lose them. Don't get discouraged. And as our wonderful and wise panelist said earlier, it's okay to be to have failure sometimes. And it's okay also to not have a plan. The reality is that most of our careers haven't been planned. Uh, we kind of, fate also guides you in your career. And it's important to also have a certain kind of flexibility. And if you're prepared, and if you're persistent, and you're creative, and you have goals, eventually you will get to a place that you're happy. But you don't necessarily need a plan. So I'm sorry to those. I'm sorry to those of you who have questions, but we're not the last speakers, and our and our time is up. But um, yes, there's Brayden says you can come up afterwards, and they'd be happy to talk to you about your questions. So please join me in thanking this fabulous panel for their wisdom today. Thank you. Uh, what a great friendship this is going to be. I want to say one thing and repeat something Justice O'Connor said, which I think is, is the essence of this luncheon. We don't accomplish anything in this world alone. Whether it happens is the result of the whole tapestry of one's life. All the weavings of the individual thread from one to another, from another to another. That is what creates something lasting.